Vind je dit als je daar hier naar kijkt? Ja, dat is natuurlijk enorm teleurstellend, wrang. Uh, uh, toch het gevoel dat we, dat we als internationale gemeenschap het land in de steek hebben gelaten. Met name het hele chaotische vertrek. Dat was ook iets wat het, het land bespaard had kunnen worden. Ik kan niet vertellen hoe disappointed I was. I was furious actually. I was disappointed, I was disgusted, I was furious. I was everything you can tell, you name it, I was. The way it was done was so incompetent. It's like you do not know the ABC of how to manage an exit. But I knew what was going to be happening. I knew exactly the step by step of what we are going through today, I knew it. And not only me, all of us we knew it, that's the sadness of it. Afghans knew it. Oh, yes, 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 shut up! Yes. Come on, look at this guy! Shut up! 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 Daar is besloten, we gaan weg. We vertrekken als een dief in de nacht. En by the way, vertel het ook even niet aan onze bondgenoot die met ons meegegaan zijn. Ik vind dat verschrikkelijk slecht. Ik noem het een debakel, ik noem het een schande. Ik noem het een, een schande ook voor de NAVO. Wij moeten als Europa meer invulling gaan geven aan ons veiligheidsbeleid. Het klakkeloos volgen van alleen maar Amerika is niet goed. After the chaotic departure of American troops from Afghanistan, the local population is left with a sense that everything they built up over the past two decades has been lost in one fell swoop. Now that the dust has settled, what lessons can be learned from the past 20 years? And how should we prevent mistakes made in the past being repeated in the future? And since the Taliban assumed power, how are the people who were left behind doing? We spoke remotely with activist Mabuba Siraj in Kabul via a secure connection. She's been an advocate for women's rights in her country for many years. Until recently, she sat at the table with the previous regime to safeguard the right for girls to go to school and for women to go to work. Now, she suddenly finds herself facing the mullahs and desperately trying to secure everything she fought for. This year, the women of Afghanistan are going to be fighting for something entirely different. This year, we are going to go back, 20 years back and we are going to be fighting for our rights for education, for God's sakes. I mean, is this fair? I mean, how, how is that possible? I mean, we had these things in our hands. Our girls are going to school. Now I have to start yelling and screaming that let my girls go to school. This is, this is just not, not right. Or let the woman go to work, or let the woman bring a, a piece of bread at their, at their uh, table to feed their kids. This is, this is, just, this is just ridiculous, it really is ridiculous. <laughs> We are going backwards, we really are going backwards. And that going backwards for somebody that has been here from day one when we started all of this, all of this struggle, it's, it's very hard, it's extremely hard. For years, Siraj lived abroad as an exile. But in 2003, when the prospects of a new Afghanistan that would include all ethnic groups looked good, she returned to her homeland. There, she became one of the most important advocates of the women's rights movement. I know I'm a woman, and as far as a woman being a woman, uh, maybe I'm a completely taboo, and I, they should not even look at me. I'm a, 
uh, because I, I, I'm, I've come to the belief that they really hate women. So maybe, you know, but maybe they can come over their hate for a little while and sit down and talk to me for a few minutes. And, and just not only to me, but to a group of other women and girls and that are living in this country and they want to live in this country and they don't want to get out and they are young and they are the future of Afghanistan. Maybe we can do something about it. Maybe, maybe their voices will have an effect on them as well. امروز طالبان برای زنان میگن لباس رنگی نپوشید میگن صدای کفش زنان حرام است میگن که زنان ساحه کوری زنان را محدود کردن و میگن دخترا به مکتب نروه پس ما میتونیم بگیم زنای افغانستان در واقع به جرم زن بودنشان باید به زندان خانگی به سر ببرند if we could talk to them so that for a few <laughs> for a few short seconds minutes that they can stay away from 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 giving so much importance to the women and what they are wearing if we could just stop that for a few minutes and really talk about what matters because what matters is not what kind of hijab the women are going to wear that is that has nothing to do with anything a hijab is a hijab they will wear it one way or another we always have worn it it's not something that we are doing it now we have done it always so we will wear that the most important thing is that we have to put the girls in school so we have to sit down and get this organized <laughs> In 2008, Backlight joined commander of the armed forces, Dick Berlijn, when he traveled to Uruzgan to buck up the Dutch troops there, troops who were carrying out their mission under NATO command. The Netherlands provided 1,400 troops to contribute to the stabilization of the region and the reconstruction of the country as part of Operation Enduring Freedom. At the time, the expectations of what the West would bring Afghanistan were high. How does Berlin look back on this mission today? We see now that there are more activities. People come back, go back to their houses, they work in the land again. So I can see that the people that it here again normalized, stabilized, and that is actually the reason, of course, why we are here. What I tell you here is actually precisely what we promised and what we would do. We try to our military activities. Uh, voor een tijdelijke en plaatselijke rust te zorgen om vervolgens ruimte te gaan creëren voor die andere ontwikkelingszaken. Uh, um, het is vreselijk jammer dat we dit niet veel verder hebben kunnen brengen. Dat er toch een periode is geweest dat die hoop aanwezig was, dat activiteiten meer toe zijn gaan nemen. En misschien wil je ook graag de successen wel graag zien. Hè? En dat zie je hier ook, dat ik een aantal dingen aangeef van kijk eens, we doen dit, we doen dat. Dus je wil ook graag dat dat succes uh, gaat krijgen. Als het water op het land is, zie je dat het best vruchtbaar is en dat er een hoop uh, groeit. Tegelijk zie je dat er uh, kinderen op straat zijn, mensen op straat zijn. Dat is meestal een teken dat, dat er op dit moment geen uh, mensen in het gebied zijn die, die hier de boel gaan terroriseren. Dus uh, nogmaals, dat zijn goede, goede tekenen. Salam. 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 Salam.
The reconstruction project that the West rolled out in Afghanistan wasn't just about building mosques, schools and waterworks. It was much bigger than that. It extended to training Afghan army troops, training police forces, and even installing a democratic government. Afghanistan will remain loyal to the commitments that it has made for reform, for democracy, for human rights, for the rule of law, and not be a burden on the international community. Het vertrek uit Afghanistan, daarvan kun je zeggen, we hebben als internationale gemeenschap niet het strategische geduld gehad om langer in Afghanistan te blijven om die andere zaken te helpen ontwikkelen. Als je eraan begint, dan weet je toch waar je aan begint, lijkt ja, mij. Ja. ja, je weet waar je aan begint. Um, als land, als individueel land zoals Nederland, hebben we gezegd, oké, okay, wij nemen in ieder geval uh, het besluit om in die beginfase van onze betrokkenheid bij Afghanistan om daar een belangrijke rol te spelen. Daarnaast realiseren we ons ook dat het vele jaren nog zal duren een, een betrokkenheid van de internationale gemeenschap om het land uiteindelijk op het niveau te krijgen wat je wil hebben, zodat het ook voor zijn eigen veiligheid kan zorgdragen. Uh, dan zal op enig moment wel een einde aan die missie komen. De evacuatie die we nu hebben gezien heeft ook te maken met een Amerikaans besluit, nou laat ik het zo zeggen, heel slecht of niet gecoördineerd met alle andere landen die toen besloten hebben om de Amerikanen ook te helpen in deze missie. Daar is besloten, we gaan weg. We vertrekken als een dief in de nacht. En by the way, uh, we vertellen het ook even niet aan onze bondgenoten met, waar we, uh, die met ons meegegaan zijn. Die kant op. Ik vind dat verschrikkelijk slecht. Het is ook een debakel voor de NAVO geweest, een afgang voor de NAVO, een grote reputatieschade die de NAVO daarmee heeft opgelopen. It sounded so promising, Operation Enduring Freedom. Never was the unity of the NATO allies as strong as during the invasion of Afghanistan as Western countries were convinced that the new enemy entrenched there could only be fought in unison. States like these and their terrorist allies constitute an axis of evil. This was an enemy who until then had remained hidden. An enemy who had caught us all completely off guard on that infamous day. September 11, 2001. Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. After we'd succeeded in Afghanistan, in terms of succeeding very rapidly militarily, because the Taliban basically ran away, yes, I think there was some optimism that maybe we could remake the world. Maybe post 9-11, we could make the world a safer place. There was a greater chance for democracy around the world. Jonathan Powell was cabinet chief for Tony Blair in the early 2000s. He was present when Tony Blair traveled to Washington to address Congress on how he would fight shoulder to shoulder with his American friends in the war on terror. Yeah, I'm just to the right there, next to Laura Bush. Yeah. We are so much more powerful in all conventional ways than the terrorist. Yet even in all our might, we are taught humility. In the end, it is not our power alone that will defeat this evil. Our ultimate weapon is not our guns, but our beliefs. At that stage, it was still seen as a success. 
and the problems that came to dog us came later. So let's say we, we roll forward 20 years. What, what has happened in between? Well, in those 20 years, uh, all sorts of things have happened. I think it's time now to try and draw some lessons. What did we get right in the last 20 years? What went wrong? If we just complete, complete doing what we've been doing up to now, the war on terror, we're going to get the same results, and those results are not good. So we need to think, what were the mistakes we made? You are writing that it was a kind of a blow to the Western psyche, almost. Yeah. All of us have realized that we were building castles on sand, and it, was, it wasn't sustainable. I think that's right. I think in what, what did you mean by that? I think in Afghanistan, we did build castles on sand. We spent huge amounts of money, a trillion dollars. We spent uh, enormous amounts of political and military effort. But we built institutions that were foreign, that had no roots. As I say, the army was based, could only survive with air power, and the airplanes could only fly with Western uh, experts keeping the planes flying. So when we pulled out, there's no air support, there's no resupply to the, the army, and so it crumbles immediately. And likewise, the political institutions. We'd introduced elections, but in the last election, very few people voted. There wasn't that kind of democratic legitimacy that you wanted. It was riddled with corruption that undermined people's confidence in it. Justice was very slow and corrupt. So we pretended that we'd built these institutions, but in fact we built nothing. The things were hollow, they were rotten, and they crumbled almost immediately. The Western hubris in imposing their model on the rest of the world is a theme that former diplomat Kishore Mabubani has been writing about for years. Mabubani was Singapore's ambassador to the UN, where he chaired the Security Council at the time of 9-11. Backlight spoke with him in 2009, and even back then, he was a man of foresight. The capacity of the West to dominate the world is coming to an end. Now, 20 years later, how does Mabubani look back on the actions of the West in Afghanistan? Well, the fundamental mistake that the United States made in Afghanistan is that it didn't even study the history of Afghanistan. It didn't ask a simple question. Why did the British <laughs> fail so badly in Afghanistan? Why did the Russians fail so badly in Afghanistan? Answer is simple. They didn't try to understand Afghan history, culture, tradition. And they assumed that you can come in from outside and transform the, the country. You can't. I think the structural failures in Afghanistan reflect an uh, inability of the United States to understand that when you're dealing with a different society, a different culture, a different civilization, you have to adapt to it. But instead, what the United States administrators in Afghanistan tried to do was to say, hey, this is the book on how you build a book, how you build a democracy in America. And they brought the American democracy book to Afghanistan. And they said, they didn't even ask, hey, does it fit Afghanistan? Does it fit the culture? Does it fit the people? And of course it didn't. <laughs> One of the problems that we made, the mistakes we made in 2001, looking back, and I was in government, so I'm as much to blame as anyone else. Uh, we should have included the Taliban in the negotiations we had in 2001. You know, they came after they'd been defeated to see Karzai and said they wanted to be included. Uh, they wanted to return to their villages. They wanted to be part of the new Afghanistan. 
And Karzai says he was told by the Americans that no, they could not come back. They could not be part of the negotiations. So we concluded a negotiation on the future without them. They, of course, went to Pakistan. They regrouped and started that civil war that took them 20 years to win in the end. Uh, we'd be much better to have had an inclusive system because that would have been no one left to attack it. In Northern Ireland, when we made peace, we didn't just make peace with the parties in the centre, the moderate SDLP and the unionists. We also included Sinn Féin, which was the party of the IRA. And we included the DUP, those on the other side. So we had an inclusive settlement. There was no one outside to attack the, uh, that inclusive government. The way you talk about it now, about inviting them to come over and be part of this, is a completely different attitude than the attitude of that moment in time at yeah. that moment. Yeah. It was unthinkable at that moment to invite them to, to, to sit at the table. Yeah. They were on the top of the most wanted list and they're still at the top of our most wanted list. How can you invite terrorist criminals, in fact, to the table? How do you do that? Well, it's much easier to have wisdom in retrospect than at the time. So again, I claim no credit. It's something I've learned through these 20 years, not that I knew at the beginning. In fact, we should have learned the lesson from our previous experience that only can you get to success through inclusion. And we should have learned it, as I say, when I was in government in 2001, we should certainly have learned it in 2008 because there was another missed opportunity then. There were real chances. Yes, in 2007, 2008, there was contact with the Taliban. There were secret channels going on. The opportunity was presented to Western governments, including the British government and the American government, to start a negotiation with the Taliban. They did not want to because they thought correctly that the Taliban are people who do not respect women's rights, who do not support democracy. We will not talk to these people. But that's the mistake. It's not not liking the people. You have to talk to people you don't like as well as people you like. One, one of the key commonsensical points about diplomacy mm -hmm that many Americans are not aware of is that diplomacy was invented to enable you to talk to your enemies, not to your friends. You know why? Because if, you, if you're an ambassador, you go to a, a court of a friend, you don't get your head chopped off. But if you're an ambassador and you go into an enemy court, you get your head chopped off sometimes. So that's why the concept of diplomatic immunity was invented. Diplomacy is about the concept of diplomatic immunity. And therefore, if, a, if you declare that a country is an enemy, the first thing you should do is establish diplomatic relations. And it's, a, it's actually a signal that you are a potential enemy. But United States is the only country that has reversed the common sense of diplomacy and says, you must be my friend. <laughs> the history of Afghanistan was a history of missed opportunities. There was a missed opportunity in 2001 to talk to the Taliban, missed opportunity again in 2007, 2008, when we could have talked to the Taliban. Uh, and then finally, we ended up with President Trump when he came in, seeking to negotiate with the Taliban in order to get out. We've been there, we've been there for 19 years in Afghanistan. It's ridiculous. They're building gas stations. They're rebuilding schools. The United States, we shouldn't be doing that. That's for them to do. Uh, at that stage, um, if you're the Taliban and the president keeps announcing that he's going to leave, what are the incentives on you to make any concessions? You think you've won, so you stick to your position. After 19 years of war, the United States finally buckled, sending their negotiator, Zalmay Khalil Zaid, to Doha to engage in talks with their old enemies. So Zal Khalilzad found himself in a very difficult position trying to negotiate with President Trump tweeting every so often he was going to get out. And the Taliban can read tweets, even if they're in English. It's terribly easy to caricature the other side, just dismiss them as primitive, as nihilists, as whatever it might be. Just because people wear turbans and have beards, if you meet the Taliban negotiators in Doha, you will discover that they are highly educated, that they do know what they're talking about. They were very hard because their position was very strong. So in these later stages of the negotiations, they were very unwilling to make concessions.
And Zalman Khalilzad was sitting right there, and he was and he was doing all of the talks that he always does, uh, telling I don't even know what the man, what kind of stories the man was feeding to these people. I have no idea. Because never, nobody knows. He, he didn't tell anybody what he was talking to the Taliban. But whatever he did, whatever he said, uh, it worked. Today is truly a momentous occasion. Afghans have at long last chosen to sit together and chart a new course for your country. This is a moment that we must dare to hope. As we look toward the light, we recall the darkness of four decades of war. What was euphemistically called a peace negotiation was really no more than arranging a safe retreat for the United States' own troops. The deal that the United States made with the Taliban is that Taliban would not attack American forces, but would attack Afghan forces. So clearly, if I was an Afghan, I would feel, hey, how can you do this to me? You're supposed to defend me, right? The people of Afghanistan are getting it from everywhere. The, 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 the leaders of this country, the leaders of this country sold us even more. They made deals. They made deals with God knows whom we still don't know. Whether those deals were made with China, whether those deals were made with Russia, God only knows. Afghanistan, the world is not finished with Afghanistan. There is still a lot more that we can take from this, from this, uh, um, uh, uh, from this body of this cow that is dying. We don't know completely what was in the deal. There are still a series of secret annexes that no one has seen. But the deal was a little opaque, a little ambiguous. But what it appeared to say is there should be no attacks on cities uh, in Afghanistan and there should be no attacks on American forces. The Taliban implemented the part about no attacks on American forces. No American soldiers died um, from the conclusion of that agreement till uh, the, the, the horrible attack when they left by ISIS, by ISK. The, um, dur during that period, there were no attacks, but the attacks on the cities took a different form. They started attacking within the cities, assassinating people at universities, etc. So actually, for the Afghan people, that period became worse rather than better. You know, the world really sold us because they wanted to get out of Afghanistan. And the one way that they could get out of Afghanistan is by telling the Taliban what the fantastic guys they are. I mean, first of all, they gave everything into their hands in a way that, all right, you are the winners, you won, you are the, the, the masters of the world, you are, you are the winners. So then they started, you know, uh, making their head so big that they didn't know how to carry it almost because, you know, they thought they really are the top of the world. The new regime that came into power declared that a new moderate Taliban had emerged. Taliban 2.0 with a less extreme ideology. But who exactly are these new leaders of the Taliban? The men now in charge of the renamed Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan reads like a who's who of America's most wanted. The supreme leader is Hibatullah Akhundzada. He was head of the Taliban's Sharia courts, publicly executing murderers and adulterers and amputating thieves' limbs. He was an associate of Taliban founder Mullah Omar. The Prime Minister will be this man, Mohammed Hassan Akhund, who is on a UN terror sanctions list. Sirajuddin Haqqani has been named Interior Minister. He is wanted by the FBI and is head of the militant group behind some of the deadliest attacks, including a truck bomb explosion in Kabul in 2017 that killed more than 150 people. Mullah Abdul Ghani Barada has been named Deputy Prime Minister. Baradar was captured by the US in Pakistan in 2010 and held for eight years, but he was released to facilitate the peace process. 
د دغه درنو پټو مبارکي وایو We have to start negotiating with Taliban. We have to sit across a table from them, and we have to sit down and talk to them. We really have to. And believe it or not, that's the only choice we have now. Every other door is closed. The only, the only door that is open is this one, that we have to talk with Taliban. And hopefully, not only talk, but hopefully the Taliban will listen. Will listen to us, will listen to the voice of uh, reason, and will we'll, we'll do what, what is necessary. We'll take the necessary actions. That's what we have to do. And this is the only option left for the people of Afghanistan. Right. And are you yourself uh, so much active for women affairs? Are you also in the position that you say, even I have to talk to the to, to negotiate things myself? A lot of the women that they are in Afghanistan right now, they're all scared, so they don't want to come out and talk. So even if that's the case, then I can do that alone. But, but somebody, we all have to do it. It's just, there is no other way but, but doing that. And you are not scared to step out? And you, you know, I really, to tell you the, the truth, at this point, I really don't have much of a choice, you know? There is, a, there is a time in life, and as far as I'm concerned, being scared is one of those times that it's, a, it's affording some kind of a luxury. When you cannot, I cannot afford it. I really cannot afford it. We have to do something. We've got to do something and take this thing and control it here, now. <laughs> رنگ جذاب نوی رنگ چه خلق زان ترکش نکری دویم شرط داده دی زنان او دی پاره چه اغا عطر آگین نوی دی کور چه وزی خوشبی داره نوی Well, you know, as far as the question of trust, and I've always said that to all of my interviews, I do not trust anybody in this world. I really don't. I never trusted the government of Afghanistan before. I don't trust the international community, and I don't trust the Taliban. What I trust is action, is action of whoever is there. That I trust. If they, if they say the words that they're going to do and they do it, that's what I trust. If they don't, I don't trust. Do you understand that the Afghan people say that they feel they've been sold out? I think that's right. The Afghan people do feel that they were deserted. Um, they feel that the uh, West came in, started to rebuild the country. And most of the majority of the population welcomed the changes that were made in Afghanistan. And most of them, I think, didn't believe that the West would leave quite so precipitously, quite so suddenly, but we did. So yes, I think we have let them down uh, in what we've done. And we should have thought of other ways of doing this. And it wasn't impossible, even in that last stage of the negotiation, even after the deal had been done between the Taliban and the US, if the Americans had maintained conditionality, if they'd said, we will only implement this agreement if you implement your part of the deal, and your part of the deal is to reach an agreement with the Afghan Republic, If they had applied that conditionality, there could have been a real negotiation between the two sides. Instead of which, President Biden said that American forces were going to leave, and he explicitly said there would be no conditionality. They were leaving regardless. After 20 years, a trillion dollars spent, 2,448 Americans killed, 20,000 722 more wounded, and untold thousands coming home with unseen trauma to their mental health. I will not send another generation of Americans to war in Afghanistan with no reasonable expectation. It's very hard to see these big seismic changes in the world at the time. I've lived through two which, in retrospect, were really inflection points in history. One was the Berlin Wall. I was actually in Berlin when the wall fell. 
the second was 9-11, and it was really um, an inflection point that we now know changed the world for the last 20 years. I think we may find that this withdrawal from Afghanistan turns out to be a similar inflection point. I may be wrong, but I think when we look back in 20 years' time, we may say, yep, that's when the United States actually ceased to be the hegemonic power in the world, finally. What, ha what came to fruition after the end of the Cold War has now disappeared. Now it is no longer uh, playing in every single uh, conflict in the world. It's no longer influential in every single part of the world. We thought maybe this was a temporary phenomenon under President Trump, and President Biden said the United States is back. In fact, that's not turned out to be the case. The United States is not back. The United States is still, understandably, focused on its domestic situation and less on the world. So I think we may find that from now on we're going to have to fend for ourselves in a way that we haven't had to do for many decades. We are going to live in a much more complex world. The societies will be very different. And you, there's, no, there's no one society that will become a model for the whole world. I mean, at the end of the Cold War, after Francis Fukuyama published his essay, The End of History, Americans believe there's only one, one road forward, you know? Everybody's going to become liberal democratic societies. Now, that one, that essay, did a lot of brain damage to the West <laughs> because they put the West to sleep at a time when other civilizations were waking up, when China and India were waking up. So even India, as you know, is not a carbon copy of a Western liberal democratic society. It's very different. So that, that this diversity is something that the West has got to learn to accept, and especially the United States. Good afternoon. The United States cannot afford to remain tethered to policies, creating a response to the world as it was 20 years ago. We need to meet the threats where they are today. We also need to focus on shoring up America's core strengths to meet the strategic competition with China and other nations that is really going to determine our future and we will be more formidable to our adversaries and competitors over the long run if we fight the battles of the next 20 years, not the last 20 years. How do you view this shift from the US, from Afghanistan to China? What is happening there? Uh, it's a perfectly natural development. <laughs> because for 2,000 years of history, Whenever the world's number one emerging power, which today is China, is about to overtake the world's number one power, which today is the United States, the world's number one power always pushes down <laughs> the world's number one emerging power, always, without exception. So what, what the United States is trying to do, therefore, in trying to prevent China from becoming number one is a perfectly natural development. So for the next 10, 20 years, the US-China geopolitical contest will accelerate because that's what the United States will try to do until maybe when the day comes when, you, when China's GNP becomes bigger than the United States, then maybe things might change. But in the next 10 years, the US-China geopolitical contest will accelerate and that's why the United States wants to cut down uh, on unnecessary wars in Afghanistan, in the Middle East, so that it can focus on China. I worry that you can, by talking about something uh, and focusing on something in the wrong way, actually create a problem where it may not even fully exist. And we know that a series of uh, clashes have happened during our history when there is a rising power and a declining power and they almost trip into conflict. We saw how the First World War started by a series of mistakes. And you could find yourself in that same series of mistakes with, with China. You know, she may misinterpret what you're doing, uh, and we in uh, Europe and America may misinterpret what China is trying to do. And we actually by a series of steps. And when you look back, you think, oh my God, we've got ourselves into the situation of war, which we never intended to get into.
wij moeten als Europa heel nadrukkelijk meer invulling gaan geven aan ons buitenlandbeleid, veiligheidsbeleid. Wat vinden wij nou dat belangrijk is? Waar vinden wij dat onze grenzen zijn en waar die stoppen? Moeten wij ook de Amerikanen volgen in de Zuid-Chinese Zee? Nou, dat is een goede discussie over op te zetten of dat nou ook wel in Europees belang is. Die discussie moeten we heel nadrukkelijk voeren. En nogmaals, ja, het begint... Als, kijk, als Amerika zegt, we gaan Taiwan verdedigen tegen China als het nodig is, wat moeten wij dan? Ja, wij moeten heel goed ons afvragen, wat zijn onze belangen? Vinden wij dat ook? Uh, zijn er misschien andere uh, manieren waar, waarbij we dat conflict, dat dreigende conflict tussen uh, China en Taiwan, hoe we dat kunnen uh, uh, benaderen? Uh, het klakkeloos volgen van alleen maar Amerika is niet goed. I talked, I honestly talked to, to uh, NATO, I talked to European Union, I talked to NATO mainly. I remember when I was at a meeting there. And I talked to them and I talked to the heads of NATO and I said, and, and I said you guys have to tell me for God's sakes. Why, what is it that you have to be so bloody connected to the United States and you have to do every single thing what the United States does? Can't you be independent of your own? Can't you decide on your own? Can't you put the force and the pressure on your own? Can't you do that? And there was no answer. And they were like, yeah, ha, ha, hum, hum, you know, that type. It's like, yeah, I know, ha, ha, hum, hum. It's like, that's not an answer. Because you can do it, actually. You're Europe, for God's sakes. Why can't you stand and say, this is the stand we are taking. And this is where we want to be. And this is how we want to do it. Why couldn't you do that? Ik denk dat we als uh, Nederland, we als Europa, heel nadrukkelijk in beeld moeten hebben van uh, wat is onze eigen afweging. Wat vinden wij belangrijk, wat vinden wij niet belangrijk. Wat zijn wij nou eigenlijk als Europa? Welke verantwoordelijkheden vinden wij dat wij als Europa dragen als het gaat over de internationale rechtsorde? En op basis daarvan uh, met wie uh, vinden we dat we uh, moeten partneren? En zolang de uh, belangen van die partner overeenkomen met de belangen van Europa, dan is dat prima. En zodra die belangen een beetje gaan schuren en een beetje anders gaan worden, ja, dan moeten we als Europa heel goed uh, uh, op blijven letten. De letten we op, denk je. En ook ons uit durven spreken richting Amerika en zeggen van luister, we zijn hele goede vrienden, we hebben vreselijk veel aan jullie te danken, maar hier zijn onze belangen anders. We moeten lessen leren van de conflicten waar we bij betrokken in zijn geweest. Wat voor missies vinden we dat we daar aan bij moeten dragen en welke niet? Wij willen nadrukkelijker nadenken over welke lessen hebben we hiervan geleerd. Zijn die goed geweest? Als die niet goed zijn geweest, de dingen die we daar hebben gedaan, hoe komt dat? En kwam dat misschien doordat we in een te korte termijn denken? Te veel uh, hapsnap reageren in plaats van over de lange termijn? Uh, vaak worden we geleid door, door incidenten, er is iets verschrikkelijks gebeurd. Het komt op het 8 uur journaal. We vinden met z'n allen dat er wat moet gebeuren. De politiek zegt, nou, dan gaan we dan maar wat doen. En dan zitten we vervolgens in een missie waarvan we achteraf denken van... Goh, was het nou wel hetgeen wat we bedoeld hebben? Dat is dus niet de manier. We moeten ook op langere termijn effecten proberen onder ogen te zien. Nou, wat, wat, wat zal het effect hiervan kunnen zijn over 10 jaar, over 20 jaar? En ik denk dat er een gebrek is aan strategisch besef. En dat moet ontwikkeld worden. En uiteindelijk moet dat besef gaan leiden tot ander gedrag. Eh, namelijk niet als er iets gebeurt meteen daar naartoe rennen en proberen met haren in de brand eh, nou ja, het brandje te blussen. Maar na te denken, oké, okay, hoe komt dit? Waar komt het vandaan? Wat, wat is er aan de orde? Eh, wat moeten we doen? We may leave Afghanistan, we may take our troops out, but Afghanistan is not going to leave us. We're still going to face the consequences of collapse in Afghanistan. If this winter uh, the economy collapses and we end up with a failed state, we will face the problems of immigration. There are already uh, many hundreds of thousands on the western border of Afghanistan who will try and move across Turkey and into Europe. And we know what happened last time we faced a wave of, of immigration, what impact it had on our politics. We will face a wave of drugs. It's not just opium, they're also producers of synthetic drugs in a major way. And these will come pouring into Europe across Iran and Turkey. And we will be a face another threat of terrorism. Uh, Afghanistan has not been a base for terrorism attacks in Europe uh, over the last um, 20 years. It will be again now. Al-Qaeda is back already inside Afghanistan. Other groups are operating out of there. And we can be sure 
that attacks will be launched on Europe if we just let the place collapse into mayhem again. So we have a strong vested interest in not giving up on Afghanistan just because we pulled our troops out. Kijk eens, als er mensen op onze planeet lopen die op een gegeven moment zo wanhopig zijn dat ze zeggen van kijk eens, als er geen leven is voor mij op deze planeet dan is die er ook niet voor jou. Boom, ik blaas mezelf op en ik zorg voor een hoop ellende. En we moeten ons afvragen van waar, waar komt dan die motivatie of het gevoel van legitimiteit vandaan. En als je daar echt goed over na wil denken, dan moet je ook durven soul searchen als Westen. Dan moet je durven nadenken over hoe is ons buitenland en veiligheidsbeleid geweest over de afgelopen decennia. En als je daar niet toe bereid bent, dan blijf je dweilen met de kraan open. Uh, dat kun je doen, maar dat is kostbaar en dat betekent dat we eigenlijk accepteren dat we regelmatig met een of ander uh, vreselijke gewelddadige uh, gebeurtenis te maken hebben. En daar kun je cynisch over doen en zeggen, nou ja, zo so be it. Uh, je kunt ook zeggen, ik ga proberen te begrijpen hoe, hoe dat is. Ik denk dat dat uiteindelijk de enige weg is om hier uit te komen met z'n allen, uit deze spiraal van uh, geweld. If we don't want Afghanistan to become another another hub for terrorism in the world, really, I mean, if we don't want Afghanistan to be a place where where all of the um, the miseries of the world is going to start from here, and then there is no one around to control it, then we really have to do something about it. I don't know, I don't know what you're going to do. I don't know how you're going to do it. But somebody has got to do it. The whole world has got to do it. And that is natuurlijk de grote vrees dat. Uh... Nu de Taliban terug is en, en er zijn signalen, heb ik begrepen, dat, die, dat er een soort van een, een super samenwerking gaat ontstaan tussen Al-Qaeda, ISIS en de Taliban. Uh, of dat nou wel of niet gebeurt, maar als Afghanistan dus een vrijplaats wordt weer voor terroristische organisaties, dan gaat dat ons ook raken. So you have to really start thinking differently. How you want to get along with the world? What kind of a policies you're going to have? How are you going to get along with the, with the, with the Islamic world? What are you going to do? Because if you don't do it, then you're going to get involved in all of this. But you have to. You have to really rethink your policies. You have to rethink your outlooks. You have to rethink the whole thing. We are entering a new era. And if we don't know it, and if we don't take charge of what we are doing and do the right thing, we are doomed. Can't we understand that? When we try and help a country rebuild, we're very impatient. If we can't do it in a year, that's too long. Now, 20 years is a very long time. But actually, in places like uh, Kosovo, we stayed it. We stayed at it. In Bosnia, we stayed at it. And we have made a difference. So we have to remember that we need that patience. If a country like Libya, for example, or a country like Afghanistan is going to get back onto a stable basis, we can't do it overnight. We have to do the right things, which we didn't do in these countries, but we also have to be patient uh, and expect these will take many years, even decades. The best way to get involved in Europe is to really sit down and do a complete change, change of approach and attitude. Truly. Truly. Let's forget about the fact that who were, who were the, <coughs> the masters of the world at what time and when and, and all of that. Forget about that. Let's see how we are now. Who are we now? Where are we? Where is the Islamic world? Where is the, the uh, where is, why is these, these, these groups, these, these fundamentals are, are, are raising their heads from everywhere? What makes them a fundamental? And let's, and let's see if they can, there is something we can do to help not for that to happen. And, and what if the Taliban doesn't want to live in the modern world? Th their aim is to go back to the caliphate. That's their mission. If they revert to ruling as they did in the 1990s, uh, I fear that will be a prescription for renewed civil war. Mm -hmm. And this country has suffered much too much civil war, mm -hmm. so many decades. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why the international community has a duty, a moral duty, to see what it can do to avoid that civil war. But if the Taliban remain impervious to the demands from inside Afghanistan, because these demands are coming from the Afghan people and from outside, then I fear we'll be tipped back into yet another civil war. And that will be dangerous for all of us because we will face the price in Europe of refugees, we will face the price of terrorism, we will face the price of drugs, uh, and we'll have another failed state into which terrorists will move to mount operations across the world. So I think we have a strong vested interest of our own to try and find a solution. I'm 
must say that I really, truly admire your courage. <laughs> Thank you. There is, there is also courage that you decided to stay in Afghanistan, right, when this happened. You were not one of the people who said, I'm I have to get out of this country as soon as possible. You, you personally decided to stay. Is that, is that the case? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Afghanistan is my country. Afghanistan is where I need to be now. And I've decided to do that. For whatever is worth, I know that I might be able to do something positive in this country. That was the philosophy I came with uh, almost close to 20 years ago in 2003 when I arrived in Afghanistan. I said, I'm going to raise the voice of the voiceless women of Afghanistan. That's how I came here. And, and I worked until, and I did that until, until you know, now. And today I'm going to be doing the same thing and I'm going to stay here to see because I believe there is something positive can come out of my presence in Afghanistan. And I'm more than willing to do that, very gladly.